All right. Um, hi, Sonia and Francis. Thank you so much for being here. I am really looking forward to this discussion. I've been uh, perusing your website and doing a lot of research into um, the space in which you guys work. And um, I'm just really excited to get to talk through some of the initiatives that you guys are focused on um, and working in and um, your contributions to uh, better health outcomes for uh, Black women throughout California and the United States. Um, we're rounding out uh, Black Maternal Health Week and uh, what better way to do it than to uh, talk to an organization and to you, Sonia, who has done such impressive work uh, in this space. So this is like obviously a a Zoom call between the three of us. So it's pretty informal in structure and that kind of gives us a little bit more leeway and, and relieves a little pressure uh, on us in terms of exactly what's said and when it's said. So we can kind of, you know, feel free to, to take the conversation in any direction you'd like. Um, and just remember that we have the ability to include anything we want or not. Hannah, I just want to say thank you so much for you know, reaching out to us and for making the connection um, between our organizations and for having us, you know, during this National Women's Health Week, we are at the end of that week and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we look forward to every opportunity to talk about health and wellness for uh, Black women, for our communities, and for any opportunity we have to share the work that we do, but to also share the importance of why we do the work and what the issues are that are really impacting our community. So I'm really happy to connect and to be in a semi-informal space. You know? yes. Zoom yes. has uh, consumed our lives in many ways, but I'm glad we have this opportunity to connect in ways we may not have been able to do before. Right, Thanks exactly. Yeah, it, it does make it a lot easier and, and in some ways at least. So yeah, thank you. Um, so I'd like to, I just, if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce you and introduce, you know, potentially your audience who may see this. Um, absolutely. Frances Saunders and Frances is the administrative coordinator for California Black Women's Health Project. And she has recently joined us and she's an awesome addition to our team. And so I wanted to have Francis just say a hello. You just want to say hi. Yes. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. It's an honor. And I look forward to learning more about your organization and hearing all the information that Sonia is going to impart to the audience. Thank you, Sonia, for introducing me. Great. Yeah. And, and just to give a brief introduction as well, I am the communications manager for Population Connection. Um, we work in the advocacy and education and outreach spaces. Um, Ultimately, we're advocating for increased US funding for family planning programs internationally. Um, and we do a lot of education and outreach surrounding the connections between um, population dynamics, access to comprehensive reproductive health care, and um, environmental sustainability. Um, so we, a lot of our work and, and a lot of my research in particular is really global in scope. Um, so we're talking a lot about these macro level issues, um, but ultimately I think that there's some synergies between the two of our organizations uh, in terms of really facilitating sustainable development and promoting health outcomes for uh, women, children, and families everywhere. So it's really great to talk to uh, an organization and you, Sonia, and you, Francis, um, who are again, working in a, a, a more sort of localized context uh, in community development um, through grassroots organizing on the ground. Um, so just to start off the discussion, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, the California um, Black Women's Health Project's mission and what you believe are some of the most important aspects um, of the work you do in, in the space of, of women's health. Of course, thank you. So the California Black Women's Health Project was started 27 years ago. Um, we were born out of a national movement from the National Black Women's Health Project to uplift the voices of Black women around issues of our health, around advocacy for uh, better health access and quality health care, and to raise our voices um, you know, such that we can address uh, particularly issues of disparities that are impacting our communities, particularly and, and around the um, social determinants of health that Mm -hmm. really, you know, have, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, lens on, you know, what health outcomes we see. And so our work is centered on an 
sister circle model of engagement and we use that it's a culturally rich in, uh, initiative and intervention that we use to provide training capacity building uh, education and outreach you know, to the 1.2 million black women and girls in the state of california we are working in areas of reproductive and maternal health mental health um, aging violence prevention hiv aids and a, a host of other you know issues that impact us and where disparities are uh, particularly egregious and challenging for our communities and we are fortunate because black women speak to us and through us and we utilize their voices and and the voices of uh, our families where uh, many of us are either the administrative heads or you know the health heads and often um, the heads of our families you know we use those voices um, to support a vertical and horizontal advocacy platform so that we are addressing policy um, issues structural issues systemic issues as well as talking to one another um, mm -hmm. to build empowerment community um, and a space of love and trust and uh, commitment to uh, working together to improve our health as a community. Thank you. That I, I love how multifaceted and, and integrated the work that this organization is involved in. I think it's um, so important and something that I wanna get into in, in more detail um, throughout this discussion. Um, but before I do that, I was just interested in, in what drew you, Sonia, to this organization. Um, I know that you have a background in corporate finance, right? So. Um, how did you end up working in advocacy? What drew you to this organization and what led you here? My history is rooted in urban uh, Black communities. Um, I was born and raised in South LA um, at a time when it was referred to as South Central Los Angeles. And I grew up around and um, influenced and in some ways empowered, you know, by uh, many of the pathologies that still exist in our communities. And I was fortunate, you know, through um, education, through, you know, a number of community programs and interventions to, uh, you know, receive a lot of support that, um, you know, propelled me academically to get um, quality education, ultimately to go off to college and university um, on the East Coast and, ultimately to get a job in, on Wall Street. Um, I was always very much interested in strategic planning, financial planning, um, you know, looking at the world uh, in terms of, you know, how money moves and how money makes a difference in the lives of people globally. And I spent, uh, you know, a good deal of my uh, 20s and 30s, you know, doing work that was centered around, you know, high value finance. Mm -hmm. Yet, I moved back to California uh, for family reasons. And just as navigating you know, life in, in Los Angeles, I realized in the communities where I was born and raised, there were so many things that had not changed. Mm -hmm. Although I had been away from California for you know, 10 or 15 years and coming back to the community and seeing um, the continued marginalization, the continued um, lack of resources really pushed me to begin to think about you know, what can I do to really uplift our community? Um, I was a product of it. My life had changed significantly. You know, the trajectory was very different, but the community had not changed much, you know, in my absence. And so it just became incredibly important to me to, you know, figure out what could I do? You know, when you're, when you're of a certain income level, you can write checks and you can make mm -hmm. donations. But it began to occur to me increasingly that I needed to contribute a, a great deal more. And so becoming a, a part of a nonprofit organization, initially it was the Los Angeles Urban League. You know, for me, I was able to bring my, my skills in finance and strategic planning and, you know, those areas. And I was able to, you know, really um, make a difference. Um, and then to become CEO of California Black Men's Health Project, you know, I don't have a background in health. But what I have learned from many of my mentors in this work is that there is a health in all approach that we take, you know, mm -hmm. to our lives and improving our community, uh, improving the economics and the conditions of our community 
uh, will impact our health and make our communities um, healthier. So that's why I have chosen this work. And it really is, uh, it's different from, you know, pushing paper, you know, although highly valued paper, um, it, uh, it, <laughs> it's, it speaks to my heart and my soul and it is my life's work. I'm committed to it. Yeah, I can, I can sense how passionate you are about that. That was such a beautiful explanation. Thank you. Um, and, and this maybe sort of relates to what you were talking about in terms of the disparities and, uh, you know, the, the sort of lack of progress that you saw coming back to your community um, after a decade and a half. Um, but I, I was reading through your website, and one of the first things that, that really stuck out to me was your mission and values page. Um, and uh, the statement right away that I'd like to read out loud because I think it's, it's uh, really amazing. Um, and I think that there's a lot to unpack within it that really speaks to, to the work of your organization. Um, but right away, it says that you as an organization are unapologetic about advocating on the premise of intrinsic value in the history and heritage of Black women, employing culturally competent interventions that are relevant, appropriate, and ineffective, uh, or ineffective, excuse me. <laughs> Um, and I, I feel like that is, again, it's such a powerful statement. Uh, it's, it's really deep and heavy. And I wanna just start off by uh, deconstructing that a little bit because I think that there's some really, uh, you know, it's a, it would be a really helpful way in, in setting the tone for the rest of the conversation and helping to speak um, to the work again that this organization is engaged in. Um, but what struck me uh, initially was the premise of intrinsic value. Um, and, and that the intrinsic value of Black women is something that needs to be fought for. Um, can you expand a little bit on this uh, in the context of U.S. history and in California in particular? Of course, of course. You know, that, you know, really important um, focus of our work is aligned personally with my own, I, I used to call it my, uh, you know, my elevator speech for values. And it is connected because I believe so strongly that because you are here, because you are rooted and you have a history of something from somewhere, you have value simply because mm -hmm. you are here. It mm -hmm. starts with value and the value is diminished over time through outside forces or through maybe, you know, an absence of, um, you know, confidence or empowerment or, mm -hmm you know, self-care. And so the organization's premise is so connected to my own personal, you know, view. And that really is for everyone. That's even beyond, you know, just, you know, Blacks and African-Americans, anyone of any culture, of any heritage, you know, mm -hmm. there are roots and values there that, um, you know, should be uplifted, should be celebrated. Now, yes, sometimes, and in our case, um, in the Black community and in the nation, you know, our history is, is also connected and rooted with the Atlantic slave trade and the enslavement of our people, you know, brought here and, you know, disgustingly and horribly, you know, mistreated and abused. Mm -hmm. And that type of historical um, heritage is continuously connected to us, number one, because it continues in ways, although we call it something different, the structural and systemic racism continues to exist and continues to constantly impact, you know, our lives, our everyday lives, and continues to add, you know, stress. So the historical trauma and stress is is perpetuated daily through, you know, microaggressions, through blatant bias, through, you know, the the systems and practices that we encounter. Um, so you know, we empower, you know, Black women to say. Yes, we live in a society that doesn't value us all the time, mm -hmm. that doesn't respect us, that doesn't uplift, you know, the richness of who we are and what we bring. Mm -hmm. But, but we will press forward and not through just the lens of resiliency, because sometimes to me that implies a normalcy of, of a condition, you know, and then you celebrate your ability to overcome um, right. And not through even necessarily a healing lens, because healing requires uh, the, a discontinuation of abuse of a wound or, you know, for you not to continue to, to poke or to, 
open up wounds, but our wounds are opened all the time. However, you know, we are here and we deserve to be respected. We deserve to be cared for. We deserve, you know, to be treated well in spaces of, of health and wellness. And we deserve to have an opportunity to thrive and live in a just society where, um, you know, our bodies are valued, where our minds are valued and our experiences are valued and where our children are valued mm -hmm. and our communities are valued. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it, it really struck me initially, just, just the need to come out and say that uh, is, it really speaks to the uh, inequities of our systems and of our society more broadly. And, and coupled with that was the, the notion of culturally competent interventions. And again, um, it, it sort of my initial thought was traced back to the, the fact that there's an unmet need within the United States um, for health interventions that are accurate and appropriate for its own citizens, um, which is definitely reflective of, you know, historically seated systemic inequalities of racism, of, um, you know, uh, slavery, of all of it, right, which we're going to get into a little bit more um, later, but um, would you mind talking a little bit more about that, where that phrase came from and, and how that kind of applies to um, the work you're doing on the ground? So, I mean, we firmly believe that culture is health. Mm -hmm. There are rich cultural practices, um, community defined practices that have saved and uplifted and, st and, and stood in a gap, you know, where our healthcare system has failed, you know, or has neglected um, to provide adequate care. Mm -hmm. There are practices in indigenous cultures that you know, go back, you know, thousands of years, you know, where, mm -hmm. where people have, you know, utilized uh, cultural richness and, you know, cultural interventions to uh, provide healing um, from everything, really, um, and have used the land to heal, you know, where we have used, uh, you know, non-medical uh, interventions that have really supported our healing. And California Black Women's Health Project, we are you know, deeply involved in community defined practices and developing them and expanding them and looking for others, you know, that are, um, you know, really showing promise um, to uplift health. In, in our case, we have a program called Sisters Mentally Mobilized where mm -hmm. we train black women to be mental health advocates and activists. And we use everything about our culture and our heritage to impart a body of knowledge or a, a, you know, to bring the subject matter expertise into an environment that is rooted in um, the beauty of our heritage. Uh, we are a, um, a tend and befriend kind of people. We are a, a, a hug and love and support. You know, we take in, um, you know, families that are not our own. We take in people, we, we have a kinship you know, that is so valued and important. Mm -hmm. We utilize music, you know, for black communities, we have sung songs for our deliverance <laughs> and for our uplift and for um, our empowerment. We use imagery, we use food, we gather in circles, we're collective people. And that has really been what has helped to sustain us, you know, for, particularly the, the 400 plus years that we've been in the United States under oppression. Mm -hmm. And so utilizing these types of community practices and the culture um, and, and blending that with you know, traditional medicine, there are significant values in traditional medicine, but to bring the traditional medicine um, you know, into a, you know, in a cold way that ignores culture, religion, um, you know, femininity, you know, the things that, you know, are, are, are a part of our souls to, to, to bring traditional medicine in a way that does not respect those other parts of us is, is wrong. And for our communities in particular, um, when we have already have, we already have a distrust of the healthcare system because of its um, neglect and blatant abuse of us historically. And so now when we interface with that system, you know, we, we have a, 
a communication gap also often. We have the distrust. Um, we have, you know, when people talk about bias, you know, sometimes I say, you know, it's harm, you know, it, it, it can be bias, mm -hmm. which for me sounds a little bit soft, but ultimately it leads to harm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we strive to see um, an increase in diversity in the health professions and the integration of community practices with traditional care. Right. I, I noticed that right away as well. That one of the really unique and I think super progressive parts of your organization that might set you apart from other organizations working in the space um, is the attention paid to empowerment as a way of increasing participation in um, access to and positive changes for the healthcare system overall. Um, and this involves many different things, obviously, which you've already touched on. Um, but it includes, you know, attitudes, behaviors, people's lived experiences, um, and more holistic approaches to, to medicine more broadly. I guess you've kind of touched on that already uh, through the, the more sort of uh, holistic and, and traditional integrations of medical uh, practice and of um, mind, body, and spirit alignment. Um, within your work, because you're really focused in, in improving the, the physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional health of California's 1.2 million Black women and girls through um, many different facets of education, policy, outreach, and advocacy, which again is such a progressive way to approach health, um, which really recognizes the connections to and, and necessary alignment in body, mind, and spirit uh, in order to truly achieve better health, which is something that I think is, is really missed by our um, more corporate sides of, of our healthcare system and our reactive approaches to Western medicine and to ailments more broadly. So how do you see these two sort of philosophies and approaches um, coming together? Um, and how can we better integrate mental and spiritual health into medical systems to achieve better health outcomes? So one of the things that, that I especially advocate for as a CEO, I've been the CEO of the organization for six years, is that as an organization, you know, we are going to focus so much on how to align our work you know, with the traditional systems. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe so strongly, and it's particularly coming out of the corporate sector, you know, that, there, that there is great potential in collaboration, consolidation, alignment, finding synergies and working together. So we cannot do our work and ignore, you know, the healthcare system. We, our work must be done side by side and in partnership with the healthcare system. So, mm -hmm. you know, we strive to work closely with hospital systems, with public health departments, with behavioral health departments around the state of California and with the corporate sector. Because I very much believe that there's an opportunity for a uh, public, private and community uh, connection that, that creates a, a, a level of trust, a potential for a stream of, of funding that flows. And I should add philanthropy to this for a stream of funding that flows, streams of opportunities for, you know, for example, hospital systems, you know, who in the case of, um, when you think about maternal health care, you know, Black women enter into a hospital setting, you know, are, you know, the, the, the screen that I have behind me says that Black women are three mm -hmm. to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related um, death than, than white women. Our mm -hmm. babies die you know, at twice the rate of white babies um, during their, um, for their first birthday. I mean, these, these are frightening statistics, frightening. Um, and that disparity um, it partially exists, you know, because of, you know, a history of racism and because the healthcare system, you know, does not bifurcate the experiences of black women when we come into their setting. And what we advocate for is working side by side with a healthcare system to, to provide, you know, doula care, midwifery care, the type of care that complements, you know, what um, the, the, the OBGYN, the, you know, the obstetric care that a woman receives in a clinical setting. So how do we bridge those types of care so that when a black woman is entering, um, you know, the, the, her maternal phase that she is not you know, faced with 
having to choose between, you know, having her care, you know, simply at home or, you know, with a midwife only or a doula only, but that the hospital systems that she's connected with, that the insurance she has, you know, it can be utilized and can be, you know, uh, integrated so that she gets the best possible care. I mean, it's, it requires a level of, of um, uh, respect and trust, and it requires that a doctor trusts a midwife and that a doctor, you know, trusts a doula, you know, who is there in a, in a uh, birthing um, scenario, you know, with their patient. And so it's, it's expanding the scope of practice and it's also bridging the two scopes of practice that bring, you know, culture and community defined healing and medical healing in the same space at the same time. It's just necessary for us to work together. We, we can't do it alone. And, yeah. you know, we are only doing work that stands in the gap until the healthcare system, you know, which it, and it is happening, but until the healthcare system, you know, fully uh, finds a way to bridge you know, the work that we can do together. Right, exactly. I was, I was doing some research um, and, and obviously through this month that's recognizing maternal health uh, in general. Um, and there are some really striking statistics in the United States um, in terms of, you know, disparities in health outcomes for black women. Your website notes that mortality from all causes is 48% higher among black women in LA County than for women overall, uh, for example. And there are many um, other really concerning statistics related to mat maternal mortality rates, as you were just mentioning, um, outcomes for postpartum care, and so on. And again, it's it's really clear that these disparities are a direct result of many shortcomings in our healthcare system, but our society more broadly, um, and the sort of um, racist and uh, structurally oppressive undertones that our healthcare system has, um, you know, embodied. And um, you've kind of talked about some of the ways in which you guys are, are combating that. But I think that there's, there's also, it seems that there's so many more nuanced um, issues as well in terms of just, uh, you know, we were talking about do laws and, and, and midwives, but also like a lack of representation amongst, you know, black doctors, um, a lack of screening, a lack of, and then a, a very, uh, you know, valid cultural aversion because of such an exploitive uh, history. Um, I actually used to teach a, a class on, on gender and science, and it ended up becoming a, a pretty broad critique of, of Western science and approaches to medicine. Um, and in particular, it's really oppressive tactics. It's oversimplified and inherently like racist and sexist explanations of things. And it's inability, importantly, to recognize difference, um, I think, at least in a way that's accurate and representative. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit more to this, but it seems like there's a real reluctance among um, certain groups and communities to trust our medical system, which is entirely valid, um, which makes your work so incredibly important. Um, but yet again, there's a, there's a real lack of representation within the medical system that I'm sure um, makes it even harder to address the issues and to bridge the gaps that you're talking about. So um, how can we do this and how can we create um, and usher in more, more cultural acceptance of a medical system that has historically and even contemporarily caused so much harm and division? You know, Hannah, there, part of our work does include um, a strategy to increase diversity in the health professions, okay? Mm -hmm. We know that that's critical, but it's also a longer term strategy, okay? And so, you know, we're dealing with, you know, matters of life and death, like critical current issues. Um, but, but we have to have that parallel strategy um, because, you know, increasing diversity is, is so important that um, it's, it, I read a CNN article, and I think this is probably sometime during the pandemic, it's probably six or eight months ago, you know, that, uh, <laughs> you know, Black babies survive, you know, more often when they have a Black doctor, when there's a Black pediatrician and a Black OBGYN. And you know, for CNN to put an article out that, you know, was just that clear and, you know, they, you know, carried all the data, but it was out as if it was like a surprise, you know, mm -hmm. like it was a surprise. <laughs> and, you know, in reading it, I realized, you know, so much that, you know, it is a surprise to so many, you know, so the disparities and the, um, you know, the, the, the outcomes that exist in our communities it, they are surprises, you know, to the healthcare system. Many don't even bifurcate their data by race. 
you know, so right. they, they won't say, you know, yes, you know, more black women die in our spaces than any other race. More black babies experience this issue or this challenge. You know, why is it that one in seven, you know, um, you know, black babies are born premature or too small, you know, and, and have, you know, health challenges. You know, they, they don't, because they're not looking at it that way. So on the one hand, you have, you know, sort of um, an absence of just awareness, but the absence of that type of awareness is rooted in just a lack of care, really, for mm -hmm. intentional recognition that you are working with a culture, a race of people, an ethnic group of people that have historically, you know, been traumatized that are, you know, black women experience, you know, um, the racist, the, the impact of racism through something we call weathering, you know, like, and, and I don't like the term because, you know, it is to me, it says like, we are tired, like we are worn out, but we are tired. <laughs> and, and sometimes we are worn out. Um, but there's a way to, to twist that you know, from you know, the healthcare system where you might have a health provider who's saying, if you take better care of yourself, then you will have a better health outcome. And that's when science and medicine and training and the historical approach, you know, begins to um, you know, harm and cause a distrust and a disconnect between the provider and the patient that ultimately could lead to that patient's demise. Mm -hmm. And so for the system itself, you know, the outcome is, oh, oh, well, we lost another patient. But for the patient and the family and the community that's connected, it is no, you contributed, you are complicit in the loss of that life because of a system that has you know, been historically designed not to acknowledge, you know, the, the social determinants, the impact of history, the impact of racism on the patient. And so there are, there are schools of thought that, you know, are, are working with the health, you know, healthcare system in some ways against it, um, you know, to try to really look at what can we do for a next generation of healthcare professionals? So we are always open to coming into spaces, even like, like yours with, you know, Population Connect, to coming into hospital systems, to coming into, you know, clinical settings and providing some type of training to, and it's not just implicit bias training. It is training around the need to recognize that you bridge culture, you bring in community defined practices, you integrate those so that you don't have to go it alone as a provider. You don't have to go it alone as a provider, but if the provider thinks we know the answer, we have the only answer and we're using the medical intervention and that's it, then you are missing an opportunity to save lives. It just, right. it, yeah. it, it is what it is. And we have, as an organization, as a statewide organization, we have a responsibility to continue to ring the bell, sound the alarm, and agree to find ways to work in collaboration with systems because we can't tell our sisters around the state, don't go to the doctor, but we can not tell them, don't go alone. <laughs> That's, yeah. don't go alone. Like you need the support of another person, you know, to, to help you to navigate that space. And then we also train Black women. We train them to navigate the systems, to advocate for themselves, to feel empowered, to slow the visit down long enough to be able to have a communication that is, is positive, that gives them an opportunity to ask all the questions that they need and to get clarification on the responses and to walk away from a hospital visit or, or a clinical visit, feeling more um, supported, um, empowered, and ready to take the action you know, for um, the best possible outcome they could have given whatever health condition it is. Right, yeah, that's one of the things that I've, I've uh, felt is, is so like daunting about uh, approaching this issue is, is 
is not, like you said, it's not this reactive approach to like implicit bias. It's like the whole structure, it's the whole system, it's the whole way, way we approach medicine. It's the construction of race as a scientific term through Western medicine, which is just yes. um, a complete fallacy, but it's resulted in so much harm. So much. Um, right, so it's, it's about like these, you know, paradigm shifts, these foundational sort of structural shifts through incremental change, which is um, a really, really amazing uh, to, to listen to you explain that um, in, in such eloquence. Um, but I, and I think that, Hannah, I was, I want to say, because, you know, what, what we're seeing now, which is, um, you know, this uh, awakening of, of, of knowledge, this awakening of, mm. you know, some understanding this, uh, you know, greater awareness. I mean, when you hear the White House, you know, <laughs> make recognition of Black Maternal Health Week. I mean, that is a significant step. When you when you see um, you know legislation, you know that is you know coming out of the federal government, and we see it in the state of California. Um, when you see um, county health uh, public health departments, you know declaring racism as a public health issue. When you mm -hmm. see even states across the country, California has yet to do it, and and I do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, have an issue with that. But when you see, you know, those types of things happening, when you see an alliance even just now between our organization and yours, I mean, these are, you know, the 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 advances that give me hope for a future. I don't necessarily um, stand by awaiting for systems change, although I fight for it daily because I ha we have work to do. We have to stand in the gap and fill those gaps until the systems change. But when you see you know, doors opening, when you see hearts changing, when you see you know, shifts in, um, in communication, when you see corporations you know, um, you know, opening up their, their spaces to begin to talk about equity, diversity, inclusion, and not in a way we were doing it in the 80s and 90s where you know, we were checking boxes and you know, simply counting numbers and, and, and saying, you know, what we uh, wanted to do, but weren't really doing anything. There's a possibility for real change at this point. And I just wanted to say that, um, you know, that, that, that glimmer, that light, you know, that is there now that we see. So just wanted to- Yes, absolutely. And, and I was gonna say to you, I think one of the things that has really propelled finally, right? <laughs> it's always existed, but it's propelled education, education and awareness um, forward in terms of, you know, health disparities and obviously structural racism, police brutality, all of it is the, the BLM movement of, that started over um, this past summer. Um, uh, and it was really, really an exciting and emotionally charged time, I think for a variety of reasons, but um, because it felt like every organization as you're just talking about, instead of working in their own sort of siloed um, types of advocacy and work began really reevaluating their, their place in, in this really oppressive society for black folks. Um, and also, you know, really decided to start making the links finally between racism, classism, sexism, police brutality, health disparities, environmental injustices, and so on as being all connected and part of these broader systems of oppression, which work in concert with one another and from all angles. Um, and, and it really felt like, you know, some structural shifts were being made or at, le or at least being put in place. And of course, now things I think have um, tapered off in terms of how charged they, they were in terms of the urgency, perhaps. Um, and I fear that with a, with a new president being more progressive, maybe there's a, a more of a relaxed view on things. But um, how can we keep the, moment, the momentum going? Or, or are you kind of looking at that in a more optimistic lens? Um, or, or what are some of the most valuable lessons from that movement that we need to be pushing forward? To not turn back, <laughs> really, yeah. to not turn back. And, and you know, we, we, we do see it. I mean, but um, we also know that, you know, because we live in a society that's, like I said earlier, is not gonna stop harming. You know, it's the, mm -hmm. you know, the egregious, um, you know, <laughs> um, impact on on our communities you know particularly around you know the you know this the structural oppression i mean you know police violence 
I mean, we, we, it, it, it's not that it just started, it's only that we are seeing it on camera. And really it's not even just that we're seeing it on camera because we've seen it on camera before, but during a time when the nation and the world had to slow down to a complete halt, mm. when you saw that on camera, it was, it was in, an, in a vacuum because you weren't seeing so many, so many other things on camera. So, you know, those, those uh, murders, you know, that happened uh, last spring and, you know, through the summer and the rise, and you said, you know, the Black Lives, Li Black Li Matters Li <laughs> Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, it, it's not new. I mean, it, <laughs> the right. movement is not new. I mean, the world began to, you know, to stand with it um, you know, last year and, and because, you know, we were in a time and a space where, um, you know, for people to see a man murdered and to watch it, you know, to watch a full eight plus minutes of the murder of another individual, you know, at the hands of law enforcement, you know, anybody who saw that and was not moved by it needs to go and check their entire heart and soul. And so, you know, we are now, you know, months away from that, you know, nearly, what, our, oh yeah, a year, a year away. And, you know, you know, we see, you know, the impact of the trial and the verdict and those types of things. And we see a new administration in the White House. Um, you know, for some of us, you know, we do see, I told you that glimmer of hope, but we also know that, you know, our nation it can be fickle <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can be distracted. Uh, and you could throw confetti in the air and, you know, people are looking at something else. Um, we are back to entertaining ourselves. We are back to eating out and to, you know, doing all of the mm -hmm. things that, you know, so are supposed to remind us so that we're normal. But in some ways, those things are going to, you know, pull us away from, you know, that moment where we really looked at our humanity, you know, as a country. Um, and I hope that that doesn't continue. And I'd hate to think that we need to see more and more and more of these um, attacks on our on our communities in order to, you know, sort of keep the, the lens of change and the lens of awareness open. Um, but sadly, we know those uh, continued attacks are going to happen anyway, are going to mm -hmm. happen anyway. And we cannot completely legislate uh, humanity and, and, and the soul of the nation. But it is a stopgap until generations can change and do better. And that's what we have to hope for, that generations will change and do better. It does seem like young people are, are uh, very active in the streets. Uh, it, it's really, really refreshing to see. Um, and in terms of policy, which is, I think, one um, you know sort of outlet from which we can, we can talk about these real structural changes from. And, and, um, sort of a part of your organization that does, um, you know, some really important work in, in your advocate training program, which I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, and just more broadly in terms of health policy within California. Um, you know, our, our focus as a, an organization is on reproductive rights and, and access to the full spectrum of reproductive care, including abortion. Um, and despite, you know, the new presidency and some really impressive as we were talking about policy moves forward um, within this effort, but you know, albeit uh, not structural enough. Um, we now have a really uh, conservative Supreme Court um, and efforts to subvert women's rights, uh, women's rights to choose and reproductive rights more broadly at the state level um, seem to happen and, and surface daily. Um, so how are you feeling about the state of reproductive rights throughout California and the United States more broadly um, are you optimistic uh, for the future? How are you feeling? Well, I'm glad you said for California <laughs> because <laughs> you know we know that there are parts of the nation where you know the the step backwards, the turn around, you know, to a time that um, you know is just really harmful for women um, is happening. And I, I'm not going to name those states. You know, uh, right now we can go into a whole conversation about it. Um, but, you know, I do want to, um, acknowledge and uplift, you know, work that's being done across the state of California and work that is being done, you know, that is being led by, you know, women's organizations and, and aligning women's organizations. Um, you know, you, know, you have Planned Parenthood, California, you know, and the and the the work that they are doing to provide, you know, increasing reproductive health and to stand, 
in for uh, the protections of a woman's right to make choices about her own health. Um, we certainly advocate for, for that. And we certainly advocate for, uh, you know, respectful, um, respectful engagement, you know, by, you know, communities where you've got, you know, sometimes you have a faith community, you know, that, and, and for, for, for Black, you know, and African Americans, you know, we are in a, we are in, in the gap between, um, you know, being a very strong community of faith, you know, through, you know, uh, you know, traditional Christian beliefs, you know, a growing, um, you know, population of uh, Black and African American Muslims um, in the state of California, and, you know, a strong belief that, you know, protecting, uh, you know, the right to life, you know, is tantamount to who we are, you know, as a people, and at the same time, you know, a, a growing, uh, you know, respect and appreciation for we have the right to make decisions about you know, our reproductive health and our reproductive choices. And so, you know, we, we stand with, you know, advocates, you know, who, um, you know, in, work to ensure, we stand with, uh, with policies that work to ensure and guarantee, you know, that women continue to have reproductive health care, um, to be able to, you know, have that through our Covered California um, insurance, um, to be able to, you know, find, uh, spaces, you know, where we can get that care, you know, whether we are in an urban environment or rural environment, um, you know, and, and to be able to get that care, you know, that is a quality level of care at a fair price that, you know, allows us to be able to, you know, purchase, um, you know, birth control or, you know, other tools and things that we need to, uh, you know, make our own decisions um, to guard our, our reproductive freedom. It's critically important. And for, you know, Black women, you know, again, I mean, I'll just go back to, you know, the issue around, uh, you know, maternal and infant health, um, you know, having, you know, safe spaces, you know, where we can, you know, get maternal health care. Um, I, I'm very pleased, you know, at uh, recent legislation, you know, that's happening at the state level. You have the, the California Momnibus Act, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, a you know, under the umbrella of the, the federal Momnibus Act. And we have uh, Martine Wilson, who's on our team, and I see that she's joined us. Um, Martine is, is a pre-licensed midwife um, who has worked many, many years, um, you know, bringing joyous and safe births uh, to, you know, to Black women. And she, on our team, uh, you know, helps us to, you know, have a greater understanding of, you know, the role of birth workers and how important and critical uh, birth workers are and how we celebrate, um, you know, those roles. And, and you know, you know, as we talk about, you know, the, mom, the federal Momnibus Act and the California Momnibus Act and, uh, you know, the legislation that's in place, and there are, there's some resistance, you know, to um, the, both pieces of legislation, but, you know, we continue to fight with partners around the state of California, um, our partners at Black Women for Wellness, at Western Center on Law and Poverty, uh, you know, with some, you know, national partners, um, the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, you know, and others on pushing this legislation forward that's going to make critical investments um, in maternal health, that's going to address disparities, that's going to intentionally work to build a more diverse workforce um, of OBGYNs and of birth workers, you know, uh, licensed and lay, you know, birth workers, and to provide extended maternal health care, you know, to address postpartum, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, health issues and to support, um, you know, a better life for you know our babies before they reach their first birthday. So, we're excited about the legislation. Um, excited about you know opportunities to move it forward and to see um, these bills passed, um, and and to see more legislation you know that um, is necessary to support you know the best reproductive health and maternal and infant health for Black families around the nation and in California. Yeah, absolutely. California is. Um, you know, much better in comparison to many other states. Um, but not and, perfect, but not Oh, but absolutely. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not perfect. And, uh, you know, really, really subject to a lot of the work that you guys are doing in, in ways that are um, really emancipatory and progressive. So um, 
I'll, you know, a lot of the, the progress in California is, is because of organizations um, like you guys um, and the work that you're doing, Sonia, in particular. And I was just curious about uh, uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's California's Surgeon General um, and has been for a few year now, years now. And I think, in my opinion, at least from some cursory research, she's done a really a lot of really great work in, in terms of health equity. Um, and beyond that, her, her research really focuses on um, the impacts of early childhood experiences like that of trauma in, in specific ways um, um, and how that sort of impacts health outcomes much later in life in terms of the sort of obvious implications like anxiety, but also more medical uh, yes. conditions like that of asthma and heart disease and, and cancer rates. Um, and from there, she's advocated for expanding funding for early childhood education and early interventions as a way of really incorporating these understandings into our healthcare system. So I was wondering what you thought of, of her work so far. Are you guys in alliance or, or you know, what can she do better to, to as an advocate? You know, I'm uh, you know, so impressed with her uh, work to bring the, you know, the ACES um, mm -hmm initiative to the state of California. I mean, that is, is, is really very much aligned, you know, with, with how we work to bring history and to say, you know, what happened to you has an impact on who you are and what is happening to you now. And most recently, um, her office has, and, and we are working in partnership. We're part of a collaborative that works in partnership with, uh, um, with her, with her office, and and we're excited about the future. Um, but most recently, I'm I'm moved by the Know Your Number um, campaign, and it's I have some mixed reviews about it personally um, because you know the ACES number, looking at your ACES score, um, you know, if you don't know it, you know then you probably are just sort of wondering why you have this issue or this outcome or this challenge or this condition. But if you look at the ACEs score and you look at ACEs and that whole practice of, of um, you know, highlighting, you know, your historical experiences as a child, the adverse experiences as a child and how they, you know, play out in your life, you know, knowing your number on the one hand is, is a look can be heartbreaking. Um, I don't know if any of you have actually gone and looked at, you know, the, the ACEs and then looked at to see, you know, where, where do you find yourself in some ways? I mean, for me, I mean, I know my number now and it's actually a little bit heartbreaking. So it's on the one hand, I'm empowered because I do know it and therefore, you know, I can begin to think about, you know, and, and of course this is a part of my work and my life anyway, but I can begin to think about, okay, you know, you know, if, if I ever have an issue with, you know, diabetes, you know, or, or and, I, and in my family, there is a, an issue of diabetes, but if I personally, you know, have an issue with diabetes, you know, I can begin to think about, you know, what is it in my history, you know, that, uh, you know, could have contributed to that, to making me more susceptible, you know, to, to that or to anxiety or to, you know, um, you know, someone who, uh, you know, has a, a, an issue with weight. I mean, you know, we, we talk in the black community about, you know, issues of, of obesity and how in the medical um, system, you know, they just say stop eating and stop doing that. And, you know, if you do this more exercise and more that, and it doesn't take into account that, you know, most people are not just eating for nothing. You know what I'm saying? They're, you know, it's like you're, you're, you're hiding something or you're covering something or you're dealing or you're coping with something. And how do we find other ways to deal and cope with those things? But your adverse childhood experiences, if you've had an experience with domestic violence or you're a child survivor of domestic violence, or you had a parent who was incarcerated, um, you know, while you were a child, or you had parents who smoked while you were in the home. I mean, there's a combinations of things that, you know, contribute to an anxious child who becomes an anxious adult, and how that anxiety then, you know, manifests itself in your body, you know, and can cause, you know, issues and challenges, you know, with your physical health. Um, but I, I like the Know Your Story campaign that's coming out of that office. Um, I do think that it's, uh, it's, it's a good PEI 
in an organization initiative, um, but I also can feel emotionally, you know, the challenges that people can have, you know, if they begin to look at, uh, you know, the, the ACEs factors and begin to, uh, you know, count their own numbers and take their own score. Just think it's interesting, but I'm proud mm -hmm. that we have an African-American woman, of course, as mm -hmm. our California Surgeon General. Um, and I do have great hope, you know, for some continued work um, that Dr. Um, Burke Harris's office can do um, in the state of California around advancing equity. Right, yeah, and um, just so our, members are clear and I'm I'm not exactly uh, I, I would probably not do it justice but aces are, are a term that's used to um, kind of describe and, and to chart really your your childhood experiences through trauma through various um, facets so that could be your relationship with your parents like you said whether or not one of them is is incarcerated um, your sort of surroundings in terms of environmental health and and so on right or is, is there any Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, the the ACES score. So, and you know, if for anyone who is who is interested in learning more about ACES, Dr. Burke Harris has a TED Talk that mm. um, it is probably a few years old now, maybe five years old now, but it is so powerful. And if you take a look at that um, TED Talk, it'll 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 shine a light for you, and you know you'll learn a great deal because all of us, you know, have you know, probably have at least one, you know, mm -hmm. of the factors on the ACE score. Um, so I think it would be worth checking out the TED Talk with Dr. Burke Harris. Definitely, I'm going to right after this. Um, so ACE stands for Adverse Child Experiences. Thank Adverse you, Childhood Experiences mm -hmm. Survey, mm -hmm. yes. Great. Um, well, it looks like we're right at an hour. So we'll just wrap up here. <laughs> Um, with with one more question. Um, thank you so much for your time and for just this amazing, uh, super informative and um, you know nuanced discussion and perspective on on health. It's been really really amazing to be a part of. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to end by talking about the sort of synergies that exist within our organization and um, how best to kind of you know collaborate and work together. Because as I said earlier, obviously. Um, our organization is working at, at much more of the, the global scale. Um, we work at policy, we work on policies that are more international, um, although we do some domestic work as well. Um, but again, ultimately, I think that there are a lot of connections between your work and ours at the conceptual level, just in terms of um, sustainable development, improving standards of living, uh, facilitating sustainable development. Um, but because our, in our work, um, which is so global in scope, um, it, it can be hard to really tease out some of the nuances in health and access and cultural competency, um, structural uh, inequities and, and so on. Um, so I'm just curious if you work with any organizations, other organizations that are working at, at this uh, you know, bigger scale. Um, and then similarly, uh, I just like to, to ask you know, what you think is, is most important for orgs, organizations like ours, um, which are, again, cover a variety of issues, but most fundamentally health and education, um, to understand at the more local levels um, in order to be better advocates uh, for organizations working at the local and, and macro levels to um, form a more sort of cohesive message um, overall um, in the most effective ways. And I know that's kind of a broad question, but... Um, <laughs> You know, Hannah, you know, just um, the outreach um, that you all have done to us here at California Black Youth Health Project is mm -hmm. so important. It is really, it's that first start. It's getting to know one another. It's getting to know, um, you know, our respective work. It's finding, you know, the alignment and the synergies so that we can have conversations like this. It's learning from one another. Um, it's also finding ways to show up together. Um, there are spaces that, you know, I know that if I show up there with you and we are there on a panel together, or, you know, once we go back to physical you know, connections, mm -hmm. um, that we are showing up, you know, at a conference together, that we are working together um, to, you know, put together a presentation you know, that, that bridges the connection between the, the local or the national and the global. I mean, there's so much that we can learn about practices that are going on across the globe and ways in which we can improve health equity, access, 
you know, knowledge, understanding, advocacy. I mean, there's, there's, there are things that are happening, um, you know, I, and I'm only thinking of, of a few places, you know. I mean, right now you are seeing, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic really sweeping through India. And, you know, with, uh, you know, the, you know, one of the largest population, uh, you know, groups in the entire world, and you're seeing, you know, what is happening on the ground. And the United States, I mean, you know, we saw the, you know, the truly, um, you know, challenging disparities of COVID impact on marginalized populations. And in India, you know, it would be, you know, I would be very curious to know, you know, because there are significant socioeconomic disparities, you know, that exist um, and, and, and inter-tribal, racial, ethnic, you know, um, you know, strat, uh, the stratified, um, you know, issues around, you know, who belongs to which class and, you know, how healthcare is, is, is um, you know, happening there on the ground uh, in response to COVID. And I would love to know, you know, what the advocacy work looks, looks like you know, on the ground. I mean, we see things on CNN International, but, you know, if, if you could bring, you know, um, best practices, you know, to us, you know, things that we can use to inform our work, that to me is a way, you know, that we can learn from one another and work together and find ways to, you know, to uplift what we're doing. And for Black communities in California in particular, and even, you know, the, the struggles and the challenges that, you know, Black, um, healthcare workers are having, activists, advocates on the ground, like, you know, like we are in community-based organizations, and even more grassroots, you know, where, you know, people are in communities, you know, without the funding support, you know, of a nonprofit organization, despite the fact that we have very little support relative to what we're doing, you know, there are people who are making a difference. And, you know, we would love to be able to share, you know, that type of our work, you know, with you and with your organization. So there is alignment, there's opportunity, but really where we can show up together, where we can present together, where we can stand side by side, you know, talking about, you know, health advocacy, equity, reproductive rights, maternal and infant, you know, um, health care, um, disparities reduction, you know, mental health, postpartum care. I mean, that to me is the way that you know, we can be most effective. And I hope that you know, you'll be open to that. I think you are. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I know that we certainly are. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that Exactly. I, I look so forward to collaborating in the future and to, um, I think that the idea of hosting panel discussions is, is great. And um, in terms of our work, I'm happy to share resources with you on the more international state of things. And um, yeah, I look forward to collaborating in the future. And again, thank you so much uh, for this conversation, for being open to the interview. I learned a lot. I am just so excited about everything that uh, I learned and that uh, your organization is involved in. And yeah, I'm looking forward to keeping in contact into the future. So thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. Thank All right. You so have much. a great Please, weekend. Uh, tell Alex we said hello and uh, I will. We'll look forward to connecting soon. I will definitely. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye.